Well, welcome back. Uh, we continue to uh, go through our uh, history of uh, America here. Uh, our next little uh, clip is going to be on what is known as the Constitutional Convention and the compromises that, that came to be in the year 1787. So basically what we're looking at here is uh, obviously a building in Philadelphia. This is where the, uh, the delegates met to uh, fix the problems of the new nation. So this is considered to be what's known as the Constitutional Convention, 1787. Uh, as we continue to roll through this here, uh, it was pretty clear during the 1780s that the national government was just weak. Uh, they built a government at the top that seemed to not have enough power to, uh, to do its job. What event kind of showcases that is something known as Shays' Rebellion, all right? Uh, Daniel Shays was a, a farmer in Massachusetts. He was a western farmer of that state. The, uh, the state of Massachusetts began taxing its citizens. The, the folks in the, the eastern portions of Massachusetts could afford to pay the tax, whereas the, the western farmers could not. Uh, they, they just could not pay the tax. So uh, they, were being, uh, they were being arrested. Uh, they were uh, going to courthouses, and uh, they were eventually jailed for, for being in debt. So what is uh, Shays or Daniel Shays, you should know? Uh, 1786 represented a group of farmers who were, in fact, in debt. Daniel Shays would be their leader. So uh, they did revolt. Things did get uh, pretty violent. Uh, I know that uh, he shut down a lot of courthouses. He, uh, he was attacking the, uh, the establishment of uh, Massachusetts, and, uh, you know, it got pretty bad. Uh, the state of Massachusetts goes to the national government for help, and, of course, under the Articles of Confederation, uh, they could not help. And you remember from our last video, I mean, why didn't the Articles of Confederation, our first national government, help Massachusetts? It could not uh, tax the people, so it had no money. It did not have a, a military, so they really it, it just really didn't have any power. And the sad face there because uh, our founding fathers built uh, our first national government in 1781, known as the Articles of Confederation, and they didn't build it strong enough and zero power. So what did our, our founding fathers decide is that they're going to gather in Philadelphia in 1787, meet at this place or convene at this place in Philadelphia and hold a convention uh, to either fix the Articles of Confederation, but what ended up happening was is that they built a brand new government. So uh, the Constitutional Convention was held in Philly, lasted from 1787, it's going to last a few years, all right? Its sole purpose, by the way, was to amend the Articles of Confederation. Realize that uh, this did not happen. Uh, to amend, if you don't know that, that vocab term for yourself, it just means to alter, to change, to fix in a way to make it work. So their, their job was to, to do this amending and just fix the articles. That actually did not happen. In that little building, they threw the Articles of Confederation out the window and began to build a new constitution. So this is kind of an artist depiction of that's my man Daniel Shays from you know uh, Western Massachusetts and uh, he's you know hurting some uh, some townsfolk or uh, the people at the local courthouse or whatever so there's a group of people we're going to refer to as framers right a lot of you have kind of screwed that up in class or messed it up a little bit not farmers some of them were farmers but these are framers they built the frame of the government which we have today so 55 delegates from all the states that we had, 13 in particular, uh, Rhode Island did not send representatives, so 35 were present on a typical day. If others had business to attend to, they, they went to do that. They met at a place called Independence Hall. Now, if you do remember, that's the same building that Thomas Jefferson had penned, and a group of men uh, decided to declare our independence located in Philadelphia, all right? Uh, when you take a look at who these framers were, I mean, you can see 29 held college degrees. So at least, you know, half of them were pretty much uh, educated to a pretty far level. 34 of them were lawyers, some self-taught, but they were still lawyers. 24 served in the Continental Congress that we had under the Articles of Confederation. So they realized how little power they had in terms of that government and that governmental structure. 21 were military officers of the American Revolution. They fought against the king, and they certainly weren't going to create a government that simply looked like the king. All right? 
Uh, there were some, you know, framers who are more notable than others, right? Some of these names you're probably going to remember throughout uh, history or uh, from what you previous learned, right? George Washington was obviously the president of this convention. He was also the commander-in-chief during the American Revolution, and single-handedly with his leadership abilities, people say he pretty much won the American Revolution for America with his decisions and keeping, the, uh, keeping these band of brothers together. James Madison would have been, uh, I would say, the most influential uh, of this meeting. He's uh, given the nickname of being the father of the Constitution. And uh, he was the most well-read in terms of governmental structures. He read things from ancient Greek and ancient Roman. Uh, he was kind of a bookworm. So he kind of knew all other governments that have came before us. So what he's going to do is cherry pick the good things from all those governments and, and kind of build the government which we have today. So you've got to give James Madison a lot of kudos, all right? Two other real notables here, Ben Franklin and Alexander Hamilton. Ben Franklin from Pennsylvania, Hamilton's from New York State. Uh, these guys were strong nationalists, and there was a group of people who really felt at this time our federal government needed more power. Ben Franklin... Hamilton are among the, the staunch supporters of, hey, you got to give this government enough power to do its job. All right? uh, it is nice to look at the notable framers, but as we, we begin to look, there were some key names absent, some key people absent. Okay, Thomas Jefferson was not there. He was there for the Declaration of Independence. He would not be there for the formation of our new government. Uh, John Adams, a uh, lawyer, uh, Bostonian. Uh, these guys were working as diplomats in Europe. Uh, discussing issues with uh, Britain and France. So they were not uh, at these meetings, all right? Patrick Henry, a uh, big name from Virginia, should have been there. Uh, he decided personally not to attend. He was uh, afraid that this uh, convention is going to create too strong of a government. Uh, he was definitely anti-king. If you remember Patrick Henry, famous quote, give me liberty or give me death. He wanted his freedoms. and He's very concerned that they're going to create a government that's too big, okay? Who else was not present? There were no women, Native Americans, African Americans, or even poor whites. These people in our, our original society had no political or legal standing, so they were not present during this meeting. All right? we got to take a look at the weaknesses of the articles and how did they correct them by creating our Constitution. And these are things, as we begin to learn more and more about our government, you'll be able to see. We'll go through each one right now for you, but we'll see the changes on the fly as we look at the building of our brand new government, okay? Uh, the problem here in the, the Articles of Confederation, a confederacy, states have more power than the national government. That's a problem. The thing at the top needs more power. So when we look at the fix, our federal system today, power to govern is divided between the national and the state levels. Obviously, the national or federal level has more power than the states. That's an easy one, all right? Uh, old government. Congress lacked the power to enforce the laws today. Our Constitution, our congressional laws, take supremacy. They are enacted, they also are enforced, and they need to be followed by the, the citizenry of America. All right? The old Articles of Confederation, there was no executive officer, there's no leader of the nation. How do you fix that? Today we have a president. Pretty simple. Uh, the old government, no national courts, only state courts existed back then. Today, we have federal courthouses. We have state courthouses. If you live in a little city or you know local hamlet or village, those places also have courts. So every kind of level of government is going to need courts. The big government didn't. Now it does. Congress is responsible to the states. That is wrong. It didn't work. The states had too much power. How are you going to fix that? You make Congress responsible to the people. It works out, right? Uh, to make any law... This government, 9 out of 13 states needed to agree. The problem there is that it's not a majority. So you really needed uh, you know, a lot of people to agree to something to even do it. Today, how do we make laws today? It's pretty simple. If the majority of people in Congress want it, the majority will rule. That's kind of like a premise of America, right? Congress didn't have any power to tax. Well, today, pretty easy. Congress has the power to levy, means uh, enact a law or ask for a tax. They, at the same time, have the power to collect those taxes. So what we can say in, in general is Congress can collect taxes. They, they're given that power. Congress is not able to regulate trade among the states. 
Today, Congress controls what we call interstate trade, trade between multiple states. All right? Congress is also in control of foreign trade. In the old government, it was the states. In this government, it's Congress. Once again, these are fixes in the Constitution over the Articles of Confederation. Two more. Each state printed its own money. System simply wasn't going to work. There was Georgia dollars, New York dollars. It, it wasn't going to, to function. Today, we have a national currency. Congress has the power to coin money. The money we have in, uh, in Buffalo, the money we have in New York State, can be spent in Florida and California and Colorado. National currency. Any big changes to the government? So don't get confused here. To uh, Let me go back one. To create a law, you needed 9 of 13 states. To change the Articles of Confederation, all 13 states needed to agree. Well, no, at no time were all 13 states going to agree to an amendment. You had southern states, northern states. They had different interests. In. You had rural areas. You had urban areas. It just wasn't going to happen. So today we have an amendment process that you'll learn about a little later on. It involves both the federal government and state governments, but everybody doesn't all have to agree. There's going to be certain majorities, maybe two-thirds. We'll get into those later on. You'll see that we can create amendments to our Constitution. There were no amendments added to the, to the uh, Articles of Confederation. Today we do have an am uh, amendments to our document. So uh, nice slide for you. Look at the, the faults of the Articles of Confederation and how do we fix those by creating the Constitution. All right. We're going to look at four key compromises to our document. All right. Um, when they created this government, they needed to find a way to keep everybody happy. So deals were made, and we're going to call these deals compromises. There's two in particular that you have to know. All right. Uh, one thing that we know that happened was everything was discussed in secret. No outside pressures. They locked the doors in Philadelphia, and they got to work. Okay. Uh, they decided to not do what they were supposed to do, all right? Uh, our founding fathers, those 55 delegates, were supposed to revise the Articles of Confederation. What they ended up doing was writing a brand new constitution. What do I call that? That is kind of a mini revolution, all right? They basically got rid of a government that was in place and put in a brand new government, all right? What were the goals? Twofold. This is kind of difficult, but they did it. They had to create a strong enough government at the federal level, the big dog, the national level, to handle the nation's problems. But at the same time, that government could not be too strong where we would lose our individual freedoms. So they did create a stronger national government. At the same time, they found a way to protect our stuff. What's our stuff? Freedom of speech, right to bear arms, those sorts of things. So we did keep them. All right. Uh, the first compromise you absolutely positively must know is the Great Compromise. Sometimes it's referred to as the Connecticut Plan, but for the most part, you're going to see it as the Great Compromise, right? The biggest issue was representation. If you can remember compromise and representation, you should be okay, all right? There were two ideas or two plans put forth, all right? The Virginia wanted a plan that was based on uh, population. All right, so they, they called for a bicameral legislature. Right, if you don't know what that is, that is a, a Congress that has two houses. How do you know that? Bicameral, bicycle, two houses, right? States would get representatives based on their population. So if you had a lot of people living in your state, you get a lot of representatives, which gives you more power in the federal government. So what happens here? Large states are happy. Okay, but what about New Jersey? New Jersey's like, hey, I'm just a little small state. And if these large states get all these representatives, they're going to have a whole bunch of votes, and I'll always get voted out. I'll never be heard. So what New Jersey wanted was they wanted a unicameral legislature. There's only one house. And states are going to get equal representation. So it doesn't matter how big or how small you were, everybody got the same. If a state is given five representatives, the next state gets five. It's all the same. No state has an advantage. But these two plans kind of were mulled over, and they went back and forth, and the big states were sticking to their guns. They wanted it based on population. The small states, they stuck to their guns. They wanted everything to be equal. So how do you please both? Well, you create a bicameral Congress that has two houses, right? A House of Reps and a Senate. In the House of Representatives, each state is represented according to its population. If you got more people, 
You get more representatives. But in the Senate, it made the small states happy. Each state's going to get two senators. How big, how small, doesn't matter. New Jersey's happy. All right. So basically, this great compromise settled the issue over how the slaves would be represented in the federal government. All right. Did I say slaves? How the states would be represented in the government. So you got your Virginia, you got New Jersey. By the way, both of them call for the national government to having more power. And they both of those plans deal with three branches. They say, hey, we're going to separate powers at the top. We're going to have court. We're going to have a president. And we're going to have a Congress. So those, those are the three branches we'll be talking about. What kind of arose after this was the three-fifths compromise. Now we have some more problems because in the House of Representatives, population matters. You get more people, you get more power. You get more power by having more representatives in the House of Representatives. So, of course, you know, Southerners are like, we're going to count everybody. We're counting slaves, we're counting white people, we're counting everybody towards the total population. And the Northerners didn't really like that, so they come up with another what? Another compromise. Three out of five slaves are going to count towards figuring out the total population of a state so we can figure out the total number of representatives each state gets in the House of Representatives. And to make the Northerners happy, it was pretty simple. If you're going to count the slaves towards the population, three out of five of them, you're also going to count those three towards what? You guessed it, taxes. Now, if you own five slaves, now you have to pay taxes on three of them. So that, that's how that's going to work, right? So the North say, hey, we want the slaves to count uh, for taxes, but not representation. And the South say, no, no, no. We want them to count for representation, but not taxes. So what's the, what's the compromise? It's three-fifths, right? Slaves are going to count as three-fifths of a person. So a short way to remember that. It, out of every five slaves, we're only going to count three for representation and for taxation. So you got that. Commerce compromise. Commerce is a fancy word for trade. So if you don't know that, you're going to want to remember that, all right? Northerners wanted a government that could regulate trade. Southerners were very concerned that if the government controlled trade, they might shut down foreign trade. They might start taxing exports. They might hurt the South because the South sent a lot of products over to Britain. Products like what? Cotton, tobacco, rice, those sorts of things. So the Southerners feared the government would then stop importing slaves. They would also regulate that foreign trade and really hurt the South. So they had to come up with a deal here. All right? And there was a commerce compromise that was made. Our government can never, will never, tax the exports, the things going out of the country. But it was agreed at this meeting in 1787, our government could tax imports to make foreign products more expensive. The other thing, Congress agreed to, and North and South both agreed to, is they said that our government would not prohibit the slave trade for 20 years, which would end in 1808. So legally, the slave trade is illegal in 1808. What is not illegal? Slavery. Those Southerners, they, they kept it for a very long time, right? So slavery wasn't illegal. It was the slave trade that was illegal after 1808. All right. Next thing, uh, last and final compromise. So you've got the Great Compromise, the Three-Fifths Compromise. You have a compromise on uh, on trade and uh, commerce, as it's known. So well, we got to have uh, some kind of leader. So some kind of like it's one of a strong national government. They wanted the president to be elected directly by the people. And they wanted a long term of office. There was arguments here that the president should be the president for six years, eight years. Some people said 10 years. Other people said for life. Well, when we make compromises, you're not going to get everything you want, right? Some delegates favored, whoa, whoa, whoa we don't want to, we don't even want this president, right? Uh, they favored uh, more power to the states, and they said that the state legislatures should pick the president. And whoever that president is, it's going to be a very short term of office, maybe two years, maybe, you know, because if, you know, if the states don't like him, then they can't get rid of him. All right, so neither side is going to get everything they want. That's why we call compromises, right? The two sides agreed on, on simply this, right? A president's term is going to be four years. Notice, there's no limit on that. 
So if a president was good, he can continue to get reelected and reelected and reelected, of course, until, uh, what was it, 1955. It's the 22nd Amendment, all right? Uh, let me go back. Sorry about that. Also, the people are not going to directly elect the president. We are going to create an indirect system, as you see here, indirect system to elect the president. And yes, if you're thinking of the electoral college, that is the indirect system that elects the president. Our votes do not go directly to the president. Our votes go to the electoral college. Then that group of people, the electors, cast their votes for the president. We'll deal with that when we, we look at the presidency. But that's the system they created. Today, there is a limit. There is a two-term limit. Back then, there is not. It's a four-year term, unlimited. You can serve as much as you want. All right? Uh, nice little chart for you. So if you want to take some time and review that, the Connecticut, the Great Compromise, what is the issue? Representation in Congress. you got your bicameral legislature. There's your solution. Three-fifths compromise, you got your issue, you got your solution. So take a peek at that, all right? Commerce and then the presidency. Really nice chart for you. I would study that chart because those compromises are what's going to pop up on an exam time. They're going to pop up on test time. So uh, we'll look forward to seeing you in the next video, and uh, hopefully this helps you guys out. Make sure you know the four major compromises made at this convention. Pay particular attention to the great compromise. That's the big one, right? So uh, good luck, and we'll see you guys later.